Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules um, to join us today for this exciting discussion. I'm honored to be here today spending time with you and two of our panelists, John Mercanti, and um, who is currently our Deloitte C US CIO in residence and formerly Vanguard's global CIO, and Rich Nanda, best-selling author and leader of Deloitte strategy and analytics practice. My name is Anjali Sheikh, and I lead our US CIO program. And with that, welcome to Transform, Rinse, and Repeat, our monthly live conversation with client executives to share strategies on how to navigate market disruptions and drive successful enterprise transformations. John, I'm going to hand it over to you and welcome you for a quick intro before passing the mic over to Rich. Thank you, Anjali, and, and thank you, Rich. It's a pleasure to join you today for this conversation. Uh, as Anjali said, I'm the current CIO in residence for Deloitte, but I'm the former global CIO for Vanguard, really a, a title and a job I enjoyed for nearly a decade as uh, part of the executive team reporting to the chairman. I would say in my intro that I've had a blended career. I started my career as a developer. I'm a technologist at heart, um, but I've also run businesses and P&L. So I so look forward to this chat. So Rich, I think is uh, over to you. Yeah, John, thanks so much for joining us. Anjali, thanks for hosting the conversation. Terrific to be with everyone today. So I'm Rich Nanda. Um, have the good fortune of leading our strategy and analytics business. Here at Deloitte, um, had the good fortune of practicing in the consumer industry, helping um, client executives on their digital uh, transformation ambitions. Um, and yeah, get to research and write about that um, as well with the book we wrote, The Transformation Myth, and, and have since launched these uh, webcasts to spend time with executives to discuss uh, those same topics. Great, thank you. I, I think there, I, I might be a little bit blurry, so can you just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Okay, audio over video, so that's how we're gonna roll today. Uh, well, thank you both, and to get us started, um, I'd also like to invite the audience to submit any questions live. Um, we'll keep an eye on those and we'll address those questions as they come through. So let's just jump in and talk about, you know, I think a topic that is front and center of many organizations is one, the evolution of the role of the CIO, the proliferation of tech executive roles within the suite. Um, and you've seen kind of those changes in the 28 years that you were at Vanguard, in the company's tech transformation, reporting into the CEO. Uh, how have you seen the CIO role specifically over the past few years? Yeah, I think in the past, you know, the role used to be about infrastructure, help desk and operational efficiencies. But, you know, today, technology, strategy and growth and revenue are all intertwined in one thing. So I, I for, for today, more and more, the C-suite executives, the board views technology as a value creator versus an operator. And I think that's true when you think about digital data, AI, ML capabilities, they're all critical to the success of every business today. And beyond the day jobs, I think CIOs today are running internal startups, they're running JVs, they're working on partnerships, and the role tends to be, you know, good training grounds for the next CEO. And you're seeing that more and more, uh, even at Vanguard, Tim Buckley, our current chairman and CEO, at one point in his career, was the chief information officer. And I think you're seeing that as a rotational opportunity to grow future CEOs. So I think their role has dramatically changed over time. Great, and, and Rich, from your uh, cross industry perspective, how have you really seen the CEO, CIO relationship grow? Where do they agree? Where do they disagree? Where's some more agreement happening in recent times and how, they, how should they work together to really enable transformation? Yeah, I think John said it really perfectly. Um, and as technology and the use of technology is becoming um, you know, critical to how a company grows, competes, differentiates, you know, attracts customers, um, that relationship has become so critical. And you know, we've researched this and done some surveying of both CEOs and CIOs. And an interesting phenomenon is that 
actually the CEOs, you know, are rating the um, criticality of technology, the, the criticality of the CIO being a catalyst to the entire C-suite higher than the CIOs themselves. So, you know, it really is an important moment in time for technology leaders to kind of see their role in a more expansive way um, and, and really central to how the organization uh, grows and competes going forward. And, and it's not just the C-suite, the board, you know, is, is uh, similarly looking upon those technology leaders um, you know, to, be, to be true stewards of growth at the enterprise level. Uh, and, you know, when we think about kind of the role CIO plays in the success of the organization, there's an element of also what are the, the success factors, key ingredients um, for a successful CIO. And so, John, I would love to get your perspectives on how you think about success in the, from the lens of a CIO. What makes you a successful CIO? Yeah, I think, uh, I think CIO today could stand for chief integration officer. When you think about capital, you think about, you know, internal integrations, you think about external opportunities. CIOs tend to be these blended executives who understand the business, have a passion for the business, but also, you know, understand technology and how technology can enable the business. So they tend to be blended executives. They're one of the few C-suite executives that get to see the entire field of a global company. So more and more, if you, you pull these things apart, they're, they're being brought into the chairman, CEO, CFO, uh, the decision making around capital, because most capital investments, the big capital investments tend to be technology related. Almost everything's technology related today. So who better to weigh in on which initiatives make it and which don't, you know, uh, having someone who's done those technology initiatives, understands risk, understands impact to the business. Um, I think secondly, like re relationships and, and, and their, their opportunity builder CIOs inside the company, they have strong relationships. They can pull business leaders together. They see the field versus a specific silo. I think that's really, really important when you're thinking about internal integrations. You know, an example of that for me is I'm working with a company right now where their experience with inside a client's experience inside a business is really good, but they sense the, they falter between the cracks in the business when a client is a client of multiple businesses of this global organization. And, you know, who better than to see those impacts and to work with clients than the CIO. And then, you know, from the external perspective, they're strategists and business development leaders, right? They have external focus more and more company assets today are software. So, you know, what are the external possibilities for integrations or partnerships? The CIOs are leading many of those things. Um, the last two things I will say is the job tends to be a chief uh, educator job to the board and to the C-suite. Rich mentioned this about technology, whether it's the API economy, AI, ML, or risk with the board around, you know, uh, cyber or ransomware, things of that nature. And lastly, these people tend to be very resilient. They have a growth mindset. They learn from their mistakes. Uh, they embrace technology. They envision the possibility of the future. Sounds like a really easy job, doesn't it, Anjali? <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, educator, integrator, growth mindset. I, I love all of that, John. And as we really think about the CIO's role in accelerating transformation, um, these three elements really drive home the immense value of technology. Many of my recent conversations have really been with CIOs focused on how to frame digital transformation, how to message it, and most importantly, how to get buy-in from CEOs, CFOs, board, and rich from the research we've done. Seventy-four percent of CEOs have said that their company is undergoing or preparing for digital transformation. Sixty-five percent say that they believe companies have to in the next five years. And uh, when you think about most strategy officers, they all agree that advanced technologies are going to be a fundamental strategic driver of transformation. So clearly there's consensus um, that investments in technology are critical. But curious, Rich, from your perspective, what do you say to the, the naysayers that, you know, who may still see technology spent as an operational expense or, or dampening the bottom line. Yeah. 
Well, Angela, I think the, the good news is there's, you know, there's fewer and fewer naysayers, you know, out, out there um, because, you know, the, the implications of technology, how they impact the customer relationship, um, you know, how they make supply chains more resilient and nimble, um, you know, the, those data points are out there every day, um, you know, for us to see as individual consumers and, um, you know, leaders, leaders in organizations. Um, you, sometimes you hear, well, not in my sector, you know, that's a technology sector thing. It's not happening here. But even that, you know, the with the rise of, you know, innovation that's happening um, in health tech and fintech, with large, you know, players coming into consumer value chains that are traditional companies and automotive, the, you know, the, the, the writings on the wall from the digitization of our economy and then the implications to companies. So the, the good news is I think the naysayers um, don't, if they're out there, they don't need a lot of convincing, right? Because the, the digitization of the economy is so, so present and clear. I, I do think though that, um, you know, the, the next big leap, if it's not convincing um, people and executives that you know, technology and digitization is coming, it's how, right? And what, what do we do about it? And then this is where, again, the CIO um, is such an important executive because they've, they've built a career around innovating with technology. Now, the domain for where that technology is being applied is changing, but the muscles it takes um, to innovate around technology, to apply technology is something the CEO's, um, she or he is very experienced at. <clears throat> I think, um, you know, John was hitting on an interesting point that a lot of this won't only happen inside the company. It's going to happen with partnerships. And a lot of that innovation and experimentation will happen with partners. Again, the CIO has been innovating around technology with partners for um, years, if not decades. And you know that's an important skill set to rely on. So the the conversation is really going from an if to a when and how. Um, and you know I'm seeing the CIOs uh, with the clients that I'm interacting with playing a very active role in um, demonstrating the how and adding value quickly in that regard. I mean, Rich, that's that's the center of every conversation that we're having with tech executives and. John, you and I have been talking a lot about some things that uh, and concrete examples of how technology was really used at Vanguard to not only add value but direct value to the the bottom line, so in the top line. So, what what examples you have from kind of your journey at Vanguard? Yeah, no, I I think um, look, Vanguard has been uh, students of Jim Collins for a long time, and you know Vanguard's flywheel is a pretty interesting thing uh, and pretty easy to understand. I think it began with Vanguard pioneering low cost and really championing low cost invest investing through a client owned company. Those low costs increased client returns, which then increased loyalty and then increased growth for the organization. And that's the flywheel, the concept of the flywheel spin it slow but it begins to take hold and it builds momentum yeah. but um you know we pretty much vanguard had convinced the world that low cost long-term investing phenomenal service that stuff matters and our competition was beginning to replicate those things so we started asking ourselves some pretty big strategic questions when growth was exponential not when your back's against the wall but when you're growing so fast what do we think when this ends, what do we think is the next engine of growth for us? You know, what's the next disruption in financial services you know, that we are in the best position to lead and we, we believe in and, and is aligned to our mission? So you know, we came up with democratized financial advice globally. You know, so financial advice, why financial advice, why globally? Well, if you're gonna disrupt something, first it's generally expensive, so uh, financial advice is expensive. You generally pay 1% of your assets every year to a financial advisor if you use one. Internationally, that could be as high as 2%. It's going to be complicated. By the way, profit margins are high there. So it's going to be complicated. It's, you know, today, look at today's markets and environment. People feel paralyzed to do anything. They don't know whether to invest in bonds or stocks or real estate at this point, you know, given inflation and the markets the way it, the way it is today. And then, frankly, the third aspect is, you know, there is a massive 
underserved population. The people who need advice are not the hunted. The hunted are the people who are wealthy. The reality is many of us need advice and we need advice, you know, good, solid advice. So our answer to that was to begin a new startup inside the company reporting to the CIO, reporting to me, which mm -hmm. frankly raised some eyebrows around the company. You know, because product development, all the investments, the CFAs, all the CFPs, financial planners, all the technology centralized in one organization with the goal to launch direct advisory service services in many countries, in many markets. And we needed to do that efficiently and cheap. That was our goal. But we also believe that if, the, if we built the technology right, this is why it was aligned to the CIO. If we built the technology right, it would open up other opportunities, opportunities we haven't even dreamt of yet. That's exactly what, what our line was to the board. Mm -hmm. We're going to go do this. We're going to do it for these reasons. But we know if we do it right, it's going to open up other opportunities we haven't even thought of. So fast forward. By the way, did I tell you I can tell a long winded story? <laughs> we <Fast> forward. <laughs> fast forward. Where are we today? You know, the, the company has a a a cloud native global advisory platform. It's launched, of course, in the US. It's big in the US, but it's launched in the UK now. It's launched in, launched in China through a JV and it's launch, launching in Australia. Most recently launched in Germany uh, as a direct advisory market in Germany. So, you know, we can go to the board and say, okay, we set out to do these things and we're accomplishing these things. You know, this is the next engine of growth for Vanguard. By the way, it's aligned to our mission. We're giving people the best chance at a very low cost, very low cost uh, advisory, best chance of investment success is aligned to Vanguard's mission. But I think what's really interesting is what's what's happening. Um, we I, I call it stumbling on strategy. Because the technology was built right, um, We have, Vanguard also has a financial advisory business where we serve financial advisors. Well, the software is built right, and the data we're collecting about the global needs of clients is now uh, an advantage. Software is becoming a product. We can now go to financial advisors, not sell them only investment products, but we can also offer them some level of technology that can be chunked up and served to them. Uh, some level of data, aggregate data that can say, if you're building a business or managing a book of business, these are the things that matter. When you reach out to clients, this is how you reach out to clients. And most recently, American Express and Vanguard actually uh, uh, are partnering now to offer American Express members advice through that, that platform. That's stumbling on strategy. That's technology done right, gem generates revenues, but it enables adjacent opportunities, even the ones you haven't even dreamt of yet. So I'm a firm believer that technology, strategy, growth are all intertwined. Hey, John, I just got a one, give you some credit um, and maybe for the, um, you know, the the young technologists out there, if you listen to John, I mean, he is steeped in the business, right? He understood the consumer dynamics, how products and services differentiate. And, you know, with that, you can understand the promise of technology to, to innovate. And so as, um, you know, technologists out there, you know, you are strategists and you really need to yeah, real, just what John said, understand how growth and technology intertwine, just like strategists and business leaders out there need to understand the promise of technological innovation. So I give you a lot of credit, John, for, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of techno speak there as you were talking about those responsibilities. Um, and then the other thing that I think is worth mentioning is I, I love your term stumbling into strategy. If you're okay, I'm going to steal it. <laughs> but, but that's not a vanguard phenomenon. We actually research this and companies that, that really um, deliver on a growth mindset, they tend to experiment more. Um, they tend to have more innovations going on and that creates organizational optionality. We called it in the transformation that you just get more options at your disposal. Um, and, you know, while you call it stumbling into strategy, there was actual work and intent to create those options. Um, and in a digital economy, we're seeing that factor really um, multiply because of the platform effect, the data effect. You, you will undoubtedly find more options for growth and resilience the more you experiment in the bank. And 
the, we have a question from the panel before we move on to our next topic. There's a topic around tech talent, which I think is on top of mind for many, many folks, no matter where you sit within the organization. But going back to the reframing tech value um, conversation, and I'll, I'll punt this to, uh, first, Rich, to you, um, because backstage we're talking a little bit about you know how do you how do you demonstrate the ROI of digital transformation? Um, can technologists begin conversations on um, tech uh, digital transformation with expected ROI. I, I can definitely start there, but I'd love John John's opinion too. Look, I think um, any large investment is going to carry the burden of. Um, talking about returns. Um, and so, you know, we, we, you know, we need to think about transformation, the application of technology, you know, with a value mindset. I do think there's traps of getting too finite of a business case too soon. And the trap really becomes in two ways. One, um, it's probably going to be more limiting than where the returns are coming back to the stumbling into strategy conversation. Uh, and so allowing some flexibility to grow and expand the ROI case, um, particularly in the early stages of innovation is, is important. Um, and the second is, you know, there, there's an art here and a science and creating a science experiment on business cases is almost always a mistake. So, you know, you need enough of a business case that creates an envelope that gives uh, the team and the board enough confidence to proceed. Um, but, you know, try not to get too detailed about it. And, and remember that a business case is just a start. The value is likely going to come from some unexpected places as well. Yeah, I, I would just uh, add on because I, I think that's such a good point, Rich. Um, you know, for us early on when we were looking, you know, a few things happened. When we were trying to figure out, hey, are we going to do digital transformation, which includes you know, an agile or organization, organize the organization, cross-functional, empowered teams, you know, there, there were some naysayers there, you know, there's a lot of what's the ROI, like, how do I, there's a lot of that. And, and, you know, what we decided to do as a C-suite is we had one, we had one problem. Um, we had a lot of Vanguard shoppers. We had a lot of people who we believed were going to be Vanguard clients, but weren't clicking the conversion rate. And we had tried to solve this problem for like years. I mean, we had spent millions of dollars designing the website and you know, creating all these capabilities, interjections and mining data. And we said, listen, like, let's give a, a cross, and this is way early in, in our journey. Let's give a cross-functional team. Let's create a cross-functional team. Let's empower them to go figure out what they might need to do. And this team worked for six months and increased the conversion rate past our wildest dreams. Hmm. Now, I'm not going to tell you exactly how they did it, but it wasn't it, it always it wasn't always technology. A lot of it sometimes was language and confusion. They were obsessed about clients. They were in front of clients, watching, talking, seeing what was working. What they found early on was a lot of these conversions, people just it was inertia. They were paralyzed by the decisions and they figured out a way to increase it. That in itself was worth a crap load of money for Vanguard and Vanguard shareholders, right? Because you have all the profits of the company distribute to the shareholders. We needed to set up a few things like that. The other, the other thing as an I, I, if you're an IT organization, if you can convince your board that the things that matter, you know, there's a couple things that matter, of course, cybersecurity, your board, of course, is going to want to hear about that. But when it comes to development, how fast can you release real working software in the hands of internal and external clients? That's your productivity measure, deployment frequency. If you can get that then your board to say, okay, we believe more experimentation, more software release, and you're measuring the productivity of the organization. Now you're on to something. And I will tell you, when we went through digital transformation, the board was very interested in how fast are you deploying software? How safely, you know, are you deploying software? And how do we know that, you know, it's, it's in the hands of the clients and it's working. And we were able to prove that our productivity was increasing sometimes between 20 and 40% a year. Wow. So I, 
I think that's the conversation that boards should be having versus this initiative, this project, what's the return? Because this is bigger than the technology organization. What happened for us was we went to what we call new ways of working across the entire organization. And every time the CIO spoke, or the, every time the C, CEO spoke and the, and the board spoke, they spoke about the transformation. If, you're, if your CEO is speaking about it constantly, then you know it's important. The rest of your organization symbolically hears that it's important. So, so anyway, I don't know if that helps, but that, that was our little early things that we did, um, which frankly gained momentum for the organization. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, and John, you touched on, on teams and the cross-functional team aspect and, and really focused on that, that customer as kind of the driving force behind the success of the team. So I uh, was able to demonstrate, you know, the conversation more and more has been around, you know, the work for, current workforce environment, with the talent shortages, the high attrition, quite quitting, rich you know, I'm going to start with you, and then John. I really want your perspective specifically on the tech talent and building engagement with tech teams. Um, Rich, what have you seen as far as the challenges today that organizations are dealing with? But more importantly, how can leaders really alleviate these problems? Yeah, I, look, I think um, you know, no doubt, we've been through a um, a very different two to two plus years. Um, uh, with the pandemic, the virtualization of work, then the resurgent economy, and you know the talent shortage, um, especially tech talent, um, that has led to the great resignation and now phenomenon like quiet quitting. So it is a, um, you know, it's an unprecedented um, set of changes that have come around talent in two years, and particularly around tech talent. Um, you know, it's unlikely to change regardless of what may be happening in the broader economy because the information economy is still growing. And so this talent is very scarce um, and needed. And so I think we, you know, we have to agree that the phenomenon we've, we've seen over the last few years are, are likely here to stay in terms of the demand for tech talent, the mobility of that, that tech talent. And so in, in that, uh, in that context and environment, um, I'm finding clients that, really focus on the work um, and the value and the output of the work uh, is you know what what resonates with technology talent and if look the the financial package and benefits and career progression you know they all have to be there i don't want to minimize those things they matter but oftentimes the differentiator is well you know what's the impact of the work What's the team environment um, I will be in doing that work? What's the degree of innovation of the work? How much leadership support do I have for the work? So it really does come back to, you know, being, um, you know, being engaged uh, with the work that you're doing and the peers you have doing that work. And then, you know, just to bridge it back to the beginning, that's why I think this conversation we're having about the application of technology towards growth and innovation. I think you're going to win the war on talent when you can focus the talent in that, in that way. 100%. And there's this whole notion of upscaling and reskilling and so many conversations, is, you know, even if we had enough roles or the pipeline to fill the roles that technology demands today, there's not enough people skilled in that type of role. Um, there's a question that I want to address from the, the audience here on kind of how, John, have you um, as CIO really thought about upskilling and reskilling the current workforce or even creating that pipeline of talent for your organization? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, I'll tell you, one of the mistakes that you see a, a lot when you talk about digital transformation is um, the undervaluing of your current workforce. You know, I've talked to a lot of CIOs and peers who said, oh, I got to go through this digital transformation and I don't have the skills internally. I got to go out and find those skills. And, and ultimately what they build is a we, they uh, atmosphere. I think that's a huge mistake. Let's, let's say that during digital transformation, you are going to need new skills. You're going to need new talent, but that new skills and talent really has to buy into your mission. 
and your legacy environments, just like your legacy employees. They have been here for quite a while. They've been loyal to your company. So I think you have to value your legacy employees. By the way, they're eager to learn because they're, they wouldn't be in IT if you're not eager to learn. You're eager to learn. You're in technology. It changes all the time. They're <laughs> eager to learn. They have your culture. They're your culture carriers. And I think you've got to combine. You have to go to, into this with the, the attitude that I'm going to uplift the entire organization. I'm not going to build a new co and an old co. I don't believe that. I think it's one co. And it better be aligned to the mission and culture of our organization, the one that we want to have. So. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, uh, aligned to that, how, how do you build that team engagement? How do you really motivate folks? Yeah. Um, so I, I do think, you know, given all the things Rich just said, right, and, and the challenges Anjali, that you laid out in the current environment, but I think this is true. You know, CIOs, uh, any C-suite executives, CEOs, they have to focus on employee engagement. You, you, you have to grow employee engagement. Thus, you engender loyalty in your organization. You need to ennoble your mission, but it's not good enough to have a noble mission. You actually have to, and Rich, you said this, you have to align what the employees do every day to the impact to the client and the business and that mission. And once people have an environment and a culture like that, they tend to stick around. Now, we wrote about this in the CIO journal a bit. You know, we, we, we outlined four uh, practices, you know, first emphasize, you know, people leadership. I really do believe this. Ensure that your leaders are good leaders, not just good technicians. They have to be good technicians, but boy, if you have a second you know, if you, if you have a gut feel that someone's not a good leader, don't put them in a leadership role. Um, I think you measure engagement and you incent your leaders based on engagement. And then you're, you're active on the floor. Three times in my career, I got out of an office and sat in the middle of the floor in multiple buildings and just said, like, I want to be part of the thing. By the way, it takes a couple of weeks for people to get used to you before they start joking with you and having fun again. But the, the reality is, like, be active on the floor. Second, and, and Rich, you mentioned this, we moved with speed, right? This is prioritizing well-being. We moved with speed during that pandemic. We changed HR uh, you know, positions and, and we need to continue to do that, whether it's diversity, equity, inclusion, whether it's caregiver leave, whether it's flexibility. We have proven for two years that people do like, a, it's a new norm, they like levels of flexibility. And we need to avoid as an organization the one, five, one, one size fits all. It's really attractive if you run an HR organization to say, our solution to flexibility is this for everyone. But we know that that doesn't necessarily work for everyone. Mm -hmm. I, think that, I think the future is going to be design flexibility about what people need and want, what the role needs and want, and what clients need and want. And the reality is we're going to find that there's roles that are fully remote. By the way, that doesn't mean you don't show up in an office ever. Fully remote means you come in for the cultural experiences that the company has. So you build culture. And we're going to have people who work in an office most of the time. Mm -hmm. We're going to need that spectrum. And I, I do think we talked about this. Um, you got to evangelize your mission. Mission-based uh, employees, you know, based on Deloitte's research, right? Mission-based employees are 54% likely more likely to stay over a five year period. They're 30% more likely to be high performers. That's the one I love, the second part of that. That says that the same employees, if they're mission oriented, are gonna give you discretionary effort. When no one's looking, they're gonna do the work and they're gonna become the high performers. So we have to take the time to talk about our why, prioritize diversity, equity, and inclusion, align teams to business and client outcomes. And then the last thing I'll say, which is a long wind uh, for me, I know, but the last thing I will say is you have to create a culture of speed and agility. You can't attract tech talent if your development experience is slow, bureaucratic, and painful. So what does that mean? You have to attack those legacy environments. You have to build, and you, know, you have to be able to modernize legacy environments and train your staff in new ways of working. And I do mean train your staff, your existing staff too.
That was a lot. Sorry, guys. No, <laughs> I got, I got, a, on a, I got it on a tangent on that one. That was wonderful. Solid gold. Rich, any any um, comments to add to the conversation? Uh, we have another question around just what are top traits for good leadership um, as well. You know, this was, uh, there's obviously, there's lots of books written on you know, traits of good leaders. Um, so we, we certainly won't, um, you know, try and boil it down to, um, you know, a two or three minute conversation. But for me, particularly on this topic, we're having it, it the growth mindset is so central um, to building a resilient team and organization, to building one that favors innovation, um, that favors upskilling and, and development of, um, of one team as, as John talked about. And so you know, I, I personally like to espouse a growth versus a, a fixed mindset, asking why not um, versus what for things, things like that. And, and I, I've seen that um, you know, pay a lot of dividends um, with the executives that I work with as well. Yeah. It for me personally, I think, you know, coming from a non-technology background, spending most of my career in technology, the thought of being from the business or in technology is kind of those boundaries are blurring. So John, when you talk about a cross-functional team and the potential to develop talent from all sorts of um, different backgrounds is, is so key to creating that diversity in tech talent. Um, one last question, and I think this is an important one. What is the CIO's role in uh, driving tech fluence or tech savviness across the C-suite? Um, so, John, I'll start with you, and, and Rich, I'll hand it off to you for any perspectives. Yeah, and I'll, I'll be quick given time, So, uh, and that, that'll be new for me. So, <laughs> <laughs> listen, like, uh, you know, we, we talked, we joked about the, the chief uh, educator, but it is really part of the role. I will tell you that when I started in my CIO, global CIO position, you know, more than a decade ago, you know, the, the conversation around the C-suite, uh, around the board, you know, there are people who couldn't tell you what an API was and what, why, why would you want to develop, you know, what the API economy was. So, you know, uh, fast forward to where we are today, and it's a, it's a natural conversation for the board. It's a natural conversation for senior staff. Uh, and the, the executives, the C-suite, um, it's an actual conversation for everyone to, to really talk about why software is a really important asset and how designing that right is going to lead us to other opportunities. And I think it's really, really important. And I think that is the chief role. That conversation is the chief role because the chief evangelist of technology is the CIO. Great. I think the only thing I'd add is you know, if it if ever comes down to, should I go have this conversation to um, bring an idea to appear in the C-suite or a non-technology leader on the team or not, always go do it. Like each of those is a moment to um, educate, mutually learn. Um, and so, you know, on the margins, always, you know, choose to go have that uh, conversation, which could turn into a moment of education and innovation. Great. Well, with that, we're at the end of our time. That that flew by for sure. Uh, well, thank you for both, both of you for sharing your perspectives with us. Um, I look forward to continuing this conversation on the LinkedIn chat. So if there's other questions, comments, we'll continue to monitor, monitor that. I think it'll be interesting to see, one, the proliferation of the C-suite technology executive roles. You know, there's data, digital, technology, infrastructure, all of it so critical to organizations. And we really how technology conversations and the value conversations are being framed. I think, you know, there's a way to do it and there's an importance to it, but how uh, CIOs are really solving for that within their organizations, put that in the chat, as well as uh, what, what we touch upon around the tech talent shortage, uh, the upskilling, the reskilling, um, how we do that, the solutions that we are individually and collectively bringing are going to be uh, a Oh, an area to really, really watch uh, in, the, in the coming years around the, the topic of tech talent shortage. Um, you're welcome to reach out to any of us or find more insights on our Deloitte.com CIO program page. If you have any final comments or close us out here. 
I just want to thank John um, you for joining and for being uh, our CIO in residence at the firm. It's a real privilege to have you as part of the team. Anjali, awesome job um, facilitating the dialogue and fielding all the questions. And uh, thanks to everyone that, uh, that joined. We'll be back uh, the last Thursday of every month. So the 27th of October, uh, we'll be back again and look forward to seeing you then.